Welcome to Crazy Nurse RN Hub, where learning becomes a tradition. Come, join me as we explore the multifaceted worlds of nursing. Hi there, student nurses. My name is Crystal Merdukanes, Clinical Instructor Teaching Critical Care Nursing. As continuation to our discussion on the response to altered ventilatory function, we have oxygen therapy. So what is oxygen therapy? It is the administration of oxygen at a concentration greater than that found in the environmental atmosphere. It provides adequate transport of oxygen in the blood while decreasing the work of breathing and reducing stress on the myocardium. And the concentration at room air of oxygen is 21%. So what are the indications of oxygen therapy? So first, we have hypoxemia. It means it is a decrease in the arterial oxygen tension in the blood. So basically, when we say hypoxemia, it means decreased oxygen in the blood. On the other hand, we have hypoxia. It means decreased in oxygen supply to the tissues or cells. Okay, so there is a great difference between the two terms. So what are the complications of oxygen administration? So oxygen is a medication but administered in emergency cases without prescription. So please take note of these students that we do not administer oxygen without any prescription or order from the physician. However, we administer oxygen without order or prescription in emergency cases only. And too much oxygen may cause toxic effects on the lungs, on the central nervous system, and it could actually depress ventilation. So that is why oxygen should be ordered or prescribed by the doctor because it has toxic effects to the body. So what is oxygen toxicity? It may occur when too high concentration of oxygen like 50% is administered for an extended period more than 48 hours. And oxygen free radicals will damage or kill the cells. And only use oxygen as prescribed. Okay, so please take note of this. Also, oxygen suppresses ventilation. Like in the case of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the drive to breathe is a decrease in blood oxygen. And for the other complications, so the danger of fire because, you know, oxygen is one of the elements to create fire. So we have here the fire triangle. So we have the oxygen, heat, and fuel. And it could create a chemical reaction, creating fire. So very important that if your patient is having an oxygen supplementation or having an oxygen therapy, you have to write a no smoking sign at the door of your patient. And it is also a source of bacterial cross infection. Remember that your oxygen device, like for example, your nasal cannula, is connected to a humidifier. And usually, for a prolonged use, moistures developed on the tubes, on the nasal cannula. So very important that from time to time, you have to clean the nasal cannula, and as much as possible, you make it dry to prevent cross-contamination. Next, we have the methods of oxygen administration. So we have here the oxygen administration devices. So it is categorized as to low flow systems and high flow systems. When we say low flow systems, it contributes partially to the inspired gas the patient breathes. For high flow systems, however, it provides the total inspired air. So here are the examples of low flow systems. So examples of devices for low flow system, we have your cannula, 
oropharyngeal catheter, simple mask, partial breathing mask, and non-rebreathing mask. Okay? So also we have here a suggested flow rate in liters per minute as well as the oxygen concentration or oxygen setting. So here is an example of your cannula. This is actually a nasal cannula. We also have here a simple face mask, partial rebreather mask, your non-rebreather mask. And also we have here your Venturi mask. But your Venturi mask is considered as high flow system device. Next, we have your high flow systems. So the devices here are your transtracheal catheter, Venturi mask, aerosol mask, tracheostomy collar, teepees, and face tent. So along with these devices, we have the suggested flow rate in liters per minute, as well as the oxygen concentration setting. So here is an example of your transtracheal catheter. Also, we have here your aerosol mask. Also, the tracheostomy collar and the teepees. Also, we have here your face tent. Now we'll proceed to your mechanical ventilation. It is a form of therapy that is used on patients who are unable to breathe on their own. A certain level of ventilation is required in order to maintain the proper levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the body and is a form of life support indicated in critically ill patients in the ICU for short-term or long-term use. Mechanical ventilation often used to treat patients with cardiopulmonary disorders and post-operative patients recovering from anesthesia and sedation. So what is a mechanical ventilator? It is a device that is used to provide positive pressure ventilation in order to help normalize a patient's arterial blood gas levels to maintain an adequate acid-based balance. It can also provide a full cycle of breathing during both inspiration and expiration so that the patient does not have to do any work while recovering from the underlying condition. So here are the benefits of mechanical ventilation. First, it helps decrease the patient's work of breathing, which helps the respiratory muscles rest and recover. It also helps the patient get adequate amounts of oxygen. And it provides stability and allows medications to work while the patient heals. And lastly, it helps the patient achieve adequate ventilation by removing carbon dioxide for effective gas exchange. So what are the risks and complications of mechanical ventilator? First is we have the barotrauma. It is a condition in which the alveoli of the lungs rupture due to overinflation from increased pressure levels. As a result, the lungs collapse which leads to very serious lung conditions that can affect breathing. We also have your volutrauma. This condition occurs when the alveoli becomes filled with fluid due to high tidal volumes. Tidal volume refers to the amount of air that is transported into the lungs during inhalation. Volutrauma commonly occurs in patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS and those who had a blood transfusion. Next is ventilator-associated pneumonia or VAP. This condition is a lung infection that develops 48 hours or more after a patient has been intubated and placed on the ventilator. Because mechanical ventilation involves the insertion of tubes into the airway, this increases the chances of various microorganisms entering the lungs. Next, we have your auto-PEEP. Auto-PEEP or intrinsic PEEP is characterized by overinflation of the lungs due to the large tidal volumes, restrictive airways, or a prolonged inhalation time. If left untreated, this condition can progress to barotrauma and collapsed lungs. And lastly, we have oxygen toxicity. This occurs when a patient receives too much oxygen for too long of a period of time. In general, 
patient who receives an FIO2 of more than 60% for extended periods of time are at risk for oxygen toxicity. Next, we have the different types of mechanical ventilation. We have your positive pressure ventilation. We also have your negative pressure ventilation. And also, we have the invasive mechanical ventilation and non-invasive mechanical ventilation. So what are the indications for mechanical ventilation? First is insufficient oxygenation. Inadequate oxygenation, which is known as hypoxemia, can impact the functionality of tissues and vital organs in the body if left untreated. Mechanical ventilation helps treat hypoxemia by providing a sufficient amount of oxygen into the lungs so that it can be distributed throughout the body. Next, we have insufficient ventilation. Healthy lungs work to remove carbon dioxide from the body. Mechanical ventilatory support is indicated if the patient has inadequate ventilation by the lungs. It is common in conditions with apnea, chronic respiratory acidosis such as COPD and neuromuscular disorders. Next, we have acute lung injury. An acute injury to the lungs that occurs from an event such as sepsis pneumonia, aspiration, or trauma. Also, we have severe asthma. Mechanical ventilation may be indicated in patients who are experiencing a severe asthma attack that requires intubation. We also have severe hypotension. Mechanical ventilation may be indicated in severe episodes of low blood pressure, such as with shock, sepsis, and congestive heart failure, or CHF. And lastly, the inability to protect the airway. An unconscious patient with breathing difficulties may be at an increased risk for aspiration. Aspiration occurs when the patient accidentally inhales nasal and oral secretions directly into the lungs. Establishing a patent airway and maintaining spontaneous breathing via mechanical ventilation can help prevent this from occurring. So now we'll proceed with the contraindications for mechanical ventilation. If the patient legally and specifically states that they do not wish to be intubated or receive life support is the only contraindication for mechanical ventilation. And this is referred to as DNI order or do not intubate. In such a case, the patient may receive bilevel positive airway pressure or the BiPAP instead as a form of non-invasive ventilation. What is ventilatory mode? It is a way of describing how the mechanical ventilator assists the patient with inspiration. The characteristics of a particular mode controls how the ventilator functions. So what are the different modes of mechanical ventilation? First, we have your assist control mode or your AC mode. Next, we have your synchronous intermittent mandatory ventilation or your SIMV. Also, we have your pressure support ventilation or PSV, continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP. We also have your volume support, VS, Control mode ventilation, we have your CMV. Ah. Control mode ventilation or CMV. Airway pressure release ventilation, APRV. Mandatory minute ventilation, MMV. Inverse ratio ventilation or IRV. And high frequency oscillatory ventilation, HFOV. So these are the different modes of your mechanical ventilation. Now let's proceed to the mechanical ventilator settings. Now let's proceed to mechanical ventilator settings. These are controls on a mechanical ventilator that can be set or adjusted in order to determine the amount of support that is delivered to the patient. Support can be provided in the form of ventilation and oxygenation. You must develop an understanding of how each setting 
can be adjusted in order to provide more or less of each type of support for the patient. So here are the different types of mechanical ventilator settings. First, we have the mode, tidal volume, frequency or the rate, FiO2 or the fraction of inspired oxygen, flow rate, I and E ratio, sensitivity, PEEP, and alarms. Okay. Now let's discuss ventilator alarms. It is a safety mechanism on the machine that uses set parameters to provide alerts whenever there is a potential problem related to the patient-ventilator interaction. The alarms can be visual, audible, or both, depending on the ventilator setting and the patient's condition. So here are the common ventilator alarms. First, we have your high pressure. We also have low pressure, high volume, low volume, high frequency, apnea alarm. We also have high peep and low peep. When we say high pressure alarm, it is triggered whenever the circuit pressure exceeds a preset pressure limit during the inspiratory phase. Common in respiratory conditions that decrease lung compliance and or increase airway resistance. Also, some other causes of the triggering of this alarm include coughing, secretion accumulation, patient biting the ET tube, or a kink in the circuit. On the other hand, your low pressure alarm is triggered whenever the peak inspiratory pressure or the PIP falls below a preset designated level. Commonly occurs whenever there is a leak or disconnection in the system. If this alarm is triggered, the respiratory therapist and the registered nurse must first ensure that the patient is being ventilated. The patient should be manually ventilated until the source of the leak is identified. Next, we have the low volume alarm. It is triggered whenever the expiratory volume falls below a preset low volume threshold. This alarm will also sound whenever there is a leak or disconnection in the system. The respiratory therapist and the registered nurse must ensure that the patient is being ventilated and provide manual breaths if necessary until the source is identified and corrected. Next, we have your high frequency alarm. It is triggered whenever the total frequency exceeds a preset high frequency limit. The activation of this alarm can occur when auto-triggering is present due to an incorrect sensitivity setting. It can also be a sign of respiratory distress. The respiratory therapist and registered nurse include adjusting the sensitivity setting and or increasing the pressure support, peak flow, or FiO2. Next, we have your apnea alarm. It is triggered whenever the total frequency drops below a preset low frequency limit. Commonly occurs whenever there is a disconnection of the circuit from the ET tube. Respiratory therapists and registered nurses must ensure that the patient is being ventilated by delivering manual breaths until the source of the disconnection is identified. And also we have your high PEEP alarm. It is triggered whenever the level of PEEP exceeds a preset high PEEP limit. It is common whenever auto-peep or air trapping is present. Auto-peep is a complication that occurs when a positive pressure remains in the alveoli at the end exhalation phase of the breathing cycle. This increases the work of breathing for the patient. However, it can be reduced by prolonging the expiratory time. Next, we have your low peep alarm. It is triggered whenever the level of PEEP falls below a preset low PEEP limit. It is common whenever there is a leak in the circuit tubing or ET tube cough. This alarm is useful in ensuring that a desired level of PEEP is being delivered to the patient. Now we'll proceed to different drugs for mechanical ventilation. 
we administer drugs for mechanical ventilation in order to provide comfort and facilitate ventilation and airway management. The two primary reasons that medications are given are sedation and to provide patient comfort while on the machine. So here are the types of medications for mechanical ventilation. First, we have your sedatives. It affects the brain in a way that it helps the patient relax, which reduces stress, anxiety, and agitation. We also have your analgesics. It provides relief from pain. And also, paralytics. These are used to assist with intubation and surgery and to relieve laryngeal spasm. Now let's proceed to the weaning for mechanical ventilation. It is the process of withdrawing a patient from the ventilator once they are able to breathe spontaneously on their own. Extubation is a term that refers to the removal of the intratracheal tube. And your weaning is also a process that can occur abruptly or it may need to occur gradually over multiple days. In general, the longer a patient has been on the ventilator, the longer the weaning process will take. So now let's proceed to your spontaneous breathing trial. It is a technique used on patients who are receiving mechanical ventilatory support in order to test their readiness for weaning. After an SBT has been performed and the patient meets certain criteria, this means that they pass the trial and can be extubated and removed from the ventilator. If not, the patient must be placed back on full ventilatory support. Only one spontaneous breathing trial or SBT should be performed every 24 hours in order to give the patient adequate time to rest.